this is Christy Schreiber, and we're here to talk about books that changed the world and changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. This is episode number four, discussing the uh, tumultuous inhabitants of Wuthering Heights and its neighbor in the state, Thrushcrosh Grange, which is a hard <laughs> mouthful. To say. And then I have to say, uh, Bronte aptly selected the appropriate metaphor to develop the characters in the book, uh, as we've seen in the last three episodes. But just when you thought Bronte has pushed the characters as far as they could go, she takes it one step farther. Uh, in episode one, we introduced Emily Bronte herself. We met Lockwood, our first narrator. Uh, and then we met briefly most of the main characters in the book. Heathcliff, Catherine, the mom via her ghost. Catherine, the daughter. Uh, Harriton, Joseph. And, of course, Nellie, who is sometimes called Ellen. <laughs> yes. yes. And the names are a problem. And I guess we could have met the other people, except they're dead. Yeah. <laughs> There's a there lot of go. death. <laughs> There's a lot of that. Uh, so uh, here we already started uh, with the name confusion because... Uh, both female protagonists have the same name. And it's not surprising that once you get to meet Catherine number one, if you want to call her that, uh, that she doesn't exit the story, not even upon death. And Catherine number one is one character who is not going to be ignored. Um, she basically dominated our discussions in the last three episodes. And we discussed her and uh, Heathcliff's relationship as children and her relationship with the neighbors, Edgar and Isabella, and then finally the love triangle that defined her life and untimely death between herself, Edgar, and Heathcliff. Yes, Catherine's presence dominates and defines both Edgar and Heathcliff's lives from the beginning to the end. But earlier I made a statement that I want to stand by to say that Heathcliff really is the central character. And I know that's arguable, but I see him as more interesting. At the beginning, we're made to sympathize with him. He's abused and he's neglected by those who are responsible to care and provide for him. And he's rejected by Catherine, who, although she claims to love him, chooses to marry Edgar, the rich neighbor. However, after Catherine's death, we see a vengeful evil in Heathcliff that particularly defines the middle portion of the book. And although it certainly doesn't make him likable, it does make him dynamic. And if you remember in literature circles, dynamic doesn't mean you have a lot of personality. It means that you change over the course of the story. And in his case, we do see a stark difference between the Heathcliff that runs away after Catherine crushes him and the Heathcliff that returns determined to get revenge on everyone in his life. Mm, and revenge is an enormous theme. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. you know, this seems to basically center around two people, although he targets many more. He wants revenge on Hindley for abusing him as a child, and he wants revenge on Edgar for taking his girl. And of course, this brings us to Isabella and her and Heathcliff's marriage, which is nothing short of horrific. It ends as violently as it begins. And remember, he hangs her dog on the way to their elopement. Not, not a good sign. No. And on the night she leaves him forever, and maybe we should have talked about this last week, but she blames him for Catherine's death, literally saying Catherine was too smart to bear his abhorrent last name without expressing her disgust. And then he gets mad about this, picks up a dinner knife and flings it at her, her head. It strikes her beneath the ear. One final abuse because she pulls it out, I guess, in the symbolic gesture of undoing the violence that's united. That's basically been their bond, their whole marriage. And then she runs out and is never to see him again. And what we find out this week uh, is that that's just the very beginning of the violence and the and the rage and the evil that Heathcliff is capable of. I mean, uh, are, are you sure Heathcliff's been called a hero? <laughs> Even a Byronic hero? It, that seems, I know. That seems a kind description of what this guy seems to be. A psychopath would be close to what I would <laughs> Well, think. he's clearly not the traditional knight in shining armor. But you have to remember, this is a Gothic novel, and the Gothic novels have their own and very different rules. And maybe we should kind of 
talk about what those are, although we need to be brief. Gothic is the kind of word that, you know, most of us have heard, but we're not really sure we know what it means. We think we do. Gothic novels were really a fad in the late 1700s all the way through Bronte's life. And they're just some characteristics that kind of define a what these novels are about. And honestly, we recognize these kinds of novels through these traits, even to this day. For example, they usually involve a castle. Maybe it's ruined or haunted. And there's definitely lots of shadows in a Gothic novel and beams of moonlight and the blackness and flickering candles, extreme landscapes, omens, ancestral curses, and magic, supernatural manifestations, passion-driven, willful heroes slash villains, those kinds of things. Heroines in in these novels have a tendency to faint. Mm. (laughs) Heroes often don't reveal their identity until the end, although that's not the case uh, in this story. But Gothic novels have things like necrophilia. They have incest, diabolism, social chaos. There's imprisonments, that sort of thing. They play around with the concepts of fear. They like to push boundaries between things like life and death and light and darkness, sanity, insanity. And so although you don't have to have every one of these characteristics to be a gothic novel, Wuthering Heights checks a lot of boxes. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> but, you know, we had more. I mean, Scarlet Letter was a bit gothic, and Frankenstein's clearly gothic, and never mind Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I had noticed it, but I guess we've done quite a few gothic novels, I guess. I guess we have. Well, last week when we left off in Chapter 17, um, Isabella is away in London raising Linton, where she goes untouched by Heathcliff for the rest of her life, blessedly. And (laughs) by Chapter 19, uh, Isabella is dead. Yes, and as we said last week, Isabella provides this kind of transitional character between these generations, the first generation, a rendition of the Catherine, and the second generation of the Catherine, if you want to think of it like that. She gives birth to Heathcliff's son, and this is going to get confusing because Edgar brings him back to the Grange after her death, but he doesn't get to stay there. I mean, he's there less than 24 hours before Heathcliff, the father, sends for him, and Linton Heathcliff. So now you see the name confusion because Mm -hmm. the family name for Catherine is Linton, but now that's also his first name. So you have Linton Heathcliff, who is Isabella and Heathcliff's son. And of course, this is the transition into this next generation of romantic relationships. We have more doubling, if you will, because really... There are two relationships that are going to develop over the next section. One is this obvious relationship, if that's what we want to call Catherine II and Linton. In other words, Big Catherine has a daughter, if you remember, that's Mm -hmm. also named Catherine. And she and Linton are going to have a relationship. But then there's a second relationship that's going to develop almost in the background imperceptibly. And that relationship is going to kind of transpire over these same chapters. In chapter 19, Catherine II meets Linton for the first time. In chapter 20, Catherine II, I know I'm calling her that to kind of (laughs) keep her straight from her mother, she's going to meet Harriton for the first time, and she's going to enter Wuthering Heights for the first time. By chapter 27, just seven chapters later, now she's locked up and incarcerated inside Withering Heights with Linton, and Harriton is the jailer. So that's going to be a lot. <laughs> so I've got a question here. If we have I Catherine know. 1, and Catherine 1 gives birth to Catherine 2, why don't they just call her Junior? I know, because <laughs> boys go by Juniorette. <laughs> that would have uh, that would have kept the scorecard a little more straight. Oh, my goodness. I mean, these chapters are just weird. Uh, I've never read anything quite like this before, and um, the relationship between Catherine and Linton is troubling. Uh, and it's really easy to see um, that it's kind of a repeat of the relationship between Catherine number one and Heathcliff. And although Heathcliff and Catherine number one are clearly mentally ill, as we talked about last time, they do exude power and passion, and they are forces of nature, and uh, a lot like the winds that she uses uh, to symbolize them on the moors, they're strong and uncontrollable, and uh, as individuals, the the second rendition of these two is different. In Kathy's case, who's Kathy number two, or junior, as I'm... (laughs) 
in Kathy's case, we see a combination uh, between the forces of Wuthering Heights and the forces of Thrush Cross Grains, or the or the Linton side of her, which is part wild and part calm, and uh, you know it's something of a healthy mix between the extremes. Their parents, but Linton is a combination of the two as well. But it's the worst combination of both worlds. Part devil on his father's side and very frail from his mother's side. I know. And another point to make is we see the relationship between Kathy too. I'm not calling her junior. I'm okay. calling her Kathy too and Linton. They relate to each other really as extensions of their parents, not as individuals. And of course, this can't go well <laughs> if that's all you are is an extension of uh, your parent. And Heathcliff really designs these relationships. He manipulates these relationships to actually be little mini me's for for himself and and Catherine. And under his complete control. Exactly. And, well, you know, this plan can't ever work. And although lots of young parents. Um, Playfully tease with their best couple friends about making their children marry each other. Uh, we know children uh, who are actually extensions of their parents, uh, and by nature they're just handicapped, even, even if the parents are mentally healthy. And although uh, I will say, when parents are healthy, by definition, they don't, they do not view their children as extensions of themselves. They see their children as individual people. But in this case, it's obvious uh, that being Edgar's daughter. And Heathcliff's son is how these two are defined until Linton dies uh, or even Edgar dies, although to a a lesser degree. And there's a little spoiler alert there. (laughs) But I would like to point out the psychology term for this is enmeshment. And what is that? Enmeshment is the whole idea where you have these uh, emotionally exploitative relationships between parents and children. Well, one critic flat out calls the marriage between Kathy and Linton a parody of the marriage between Catherine and Edgar. And it's easy to see how that can be the case. For sure. Uh, I mean, uh, both marriages exist with one partner doing all the giving and the other doing all the taking. And Catherine, number one, um, in her relationship with Edgar is uh, overtly loud and powerful and demanding and really uh, forcing Edgar to bend to uh, an extreme confrontation that results in her death. And Linton, uh, although physically and emotionally weak, is also overwhelmingly demanding. He also is equally obsessed with himself. And in his own way, he forces Kathy, number two, to exist in his world on his uh, own very unreasonable terms, until he also just literally dies, and although it doesn't appear from tuberculosis and not emotional suicide. True. Linton, to me, is probably the most likable, <laughs> I mean, unlikable of all the characters, and there's pretty much... I think I could much... have seen that one coming from you. <laughs> They're all unlikable, but he's the most. You have a, you, you have a hard time with uh, weak men. <laughs> Gosh, okay. he's horrible. Uh, there's absolutely nothing to like about him from the first moment that he opens his mouth. Uh, like when he first arrives at the at the Grange, um, asking to go to bed and then complaining because he can't sit in a chair. And I mean, I immediately noticed that he inherited absolutely the worst of both parents. And he's sulky and he's bad tempered like his mom with none of her um, kind heartedness that would show on occasion. And he's vindictive like his dad, but with no passion for anyone, not even himself. Well, Heathcliff even calls him a pooling chicken. <laughs> mm. And what is a pooling chicken, by I the way? I know. I'd never heard that expression before in my life, but it's actually a pretty good insult. And I think uh, we should probably start incorporating it in our everyday language. Okay. Pooling means whiny and weak. And, of course, we all know what a chicken is. So if you're a weak, whiny chicken... Then you're a little Linton. You're a pooling chicken. <laughs> that is a bad insult. I mean, but it, that's also an accurate description. Uh, I mean, it seems difficult to imagine how Kathy could ever be interested in him, even as a playmate. I know, because even though we see, especially when she talks to Harriton, that she can be a brat, she really can, and she's also a bit of a snob. We as readers are made to sympathize with her pretty much from her birth all the way till the end of the book. And notice that she's the only character really like that. 
Not even Lockwood or Nelly are designed to be likable all the way through. In fact, she's described, and I'm going to read the description of her, she's the most winning thing that ever brought sunshine into a desolate house, a real beauty in face with the Earnshaw's handsome dark eyes, but the Linton's fair skin and small features and yellow curling hair. Her spirit was high, though not rough, and qualified by a heart, sensitive and lively to excess in its affections. So it's not rational that Kathy would ever give Linton the time of day. Mm -hmm. We all know stories of a person who is so likable and they get roped into a relationship with a person who is so unlikable. And and often uh, the way they get roped into the unhealthy relationship is exactly the same way Kathy gets roped into this one. And honestly, it's not rational, but, you know, humans aren't rational either. And, uh, there's nothing at all rational about Catherine being drawn to Linton. Uh, but when we see how her father raised her and really how Linton was raised, it, it makes it not only plausible, but I guess believable. Kathy is targeted. And once Kathy becomes convinced that it is her responsibility to take care of Linton and that without her, he can't survive either emotionally or physically. I mean, she's trapped in this unhealthy relationship and she's really emotionally blackmailed more than seduced to take care of Linton. And this isn't love. Um, although Kathy thinks that's what's drawing her to him and, uh, and even uses those words. And often, uh, this emotional codependency, which is a key word, it does masquerade, uh, for love in real life, but it's not, I mean, a relationship that is all one sided like this is never love. And because love has to be reciprocal. Well, let's see how this plays out. It starts with Edgar, the doting father. Remember, Catherine one has died, and Edgar is left to raise Kathy too by himself, and he throws himself into Kathy. Edgar loves Kathy one. Well, he loved her, although it's difficult to understand how. <laughs> and he truly does love Kathy too. We see that clearly in chapter 18, all the way to the end of his life. And Nellie says that the first 12 years of Kathy Two's life, the years that she spent in that household with Linton or, or Edgar and little Kathy, that was the happiest period of her life. However, just like his parents handicapped him by sheltering him, he basically is going to keep Catherine in this infantile state for the duration of his life. Nellie points out that she's never even left their property one time until she's over 13 years old. Another point to make, because her mother died on the day she was born, she's never allowed to celebrate her birthday because it makes her dad sad. Hmm. And again, uh, totally controlling the world of a child is something parents do sometimes out of fear and sometimes out of jealousy. And it's it can be well-intentioned, like maybe in this situation, uh, it's short-sighted, though, and it's going to create a terrible handicap for the child who eventually will have to face the world and hostility on her own. Yes, and this protected world crumbles when Edgar is summoned to London to his sister's deathbed and comes back to the Grange carrying 12-year-old Linton Heathcliff. And here again, we see another repetition because just as Mr. Earnshaw took in the orphan child Heathcliff, Edgar is taking in an orphan child named Heathcliff, hmm. and both will turn out to be devils, and they're <laughs> called devils by the end of their lives. However, Heathcliff, too, just like Kathy, too, is not entirely his father. And one thing that Bronte makes perpetually clear with these multiple references is that Linton also is a perpetual infant. She drives this home, and this will be the case. He's a baby until the day he dies. I mean, even the food that he eats, he must always have, and this is a quote, sweets and dainties and always milk, milk forever. <laughs> I mean, that's just an obvious reference to being a baby. True. Uh, but Catherine number two is also impeded from growing up, and in many ways she uh, is also trapped for quite a long time in uh, her infantile state. And we almost forget that by the time they get married, they're the same age their parents were when they got married. And the term that explains all this is called emotional incest. Well, Kathy's, the Kathy's, I should say, are the exact same age. Kathy, one, gets married at 17. Kathy, two, gets married at 17. But uh, Kathy, two, acts like a little girl 
not a right. teenager. I mean, she makes a plaything out of Linton. Uh, we're going to see like like he's her baby doll almost, and uh, it's this developmental delay and the, the naivete that really are going to get her in trouble. Well, another thing to notice in chapters twenty one through twenty seven is this strange courtship between Kathy and Linton that ultimately leads to an even stranger marriage. That I've wondered how could that even be legally binding, but. Heathcliff is there, always directing the action. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even more precise than that, uh, Heathcliff's revenge is directing the action. I mean, this revenge gives Heathcliff a, a sense of purpose that, uh, paradoxically, actually, uh, it in a weird way, provides order and direction to a life that otherwise doesn't have either one of those things. And I mean, what is this guy except an embodiment of revenge for the past? True. But back to this disturbing corpship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. For one thing, there is this understanding that these two are really innocent and they just don't see Heathcliff's manipulation. And they keep the relationship secret for a long time. Again, with Medley Nelly helping out, but it's all part of this plan by this master manipulator, and they are just outmanned. And the dramatic irony for every reader to see is that this is going to be painful. This is a painful back and forth. In fact, it's not even almost a secret. Nelly understands what Heathcliff is up to, which makes me wonder what to think of her. But he doesn't try to hide what he's doing from the moment Linton shows up at Withering Heights. In some ways, he wants Edgar to try to challenge him because he really believes he can take Edgar down and he'd like to see Edgar stand up to him and maybe admit that he's his equal. But here's what Heathcliff tells Nellie when she says she brings over Linton and she says that I hope you're good to him, to which Heathcliff responds, my son is the prospective owner of your place and I should not wish him to die till I was certain of being successor. Besides, he's mine, and I want to triumph over seeing my descendant fairly lord of their estates, my child hiring their children to till their father's lands for wages. That is the sole consideration which can make me endure the whelp. Here's another insult. Whelp. (laughs) I mean, there again is another reference to a dog. Uh, Weren't we going to talk about dogs today and that whole dog theme? Oh, yes, dogs. Emily Bronte and her dogs. Well, you know, Bronte was a real dog lover. She was an animal lover. And she does go out of her way to incorporate a lot of dog imagery into the story, starting with Heathcliff. When he shows up at the Earnshaw place, he's called a frightened, like a stray pup. She compares Heathcliff to dogs, actually, pretty much all the way through. You could just go through and find them. But comparing Heathcliff to dogs is only one way that she uses dogs in the story. If you remember Nasher and Wolf, those are Juno's puppies. They attack Lockwood in the second chapter. Well, they're mean and scary, and they reflect... Wuthering Heights, because Wuthering Heights is mean yes, and scary. And scary place. <laughs> yes. Uh, and the dogs kind of do this a lot. They create an expectation about what you're going to see in the story. In chapter six, Edgar and Isabella fight over a dog, and they again fight, you know, all the way through in their relationships. And Skulker, their bulldog, attacks Catherine. And you can kind of interpret this as Linton kind of attacking the serenity of Heathcliff and Catherine. Of course, we know Heathcliff hangs Fanny, Isabella's little dog. And then in chapter 19, this is more subtle, but Kathy's dogs are attacked by Harriton's dogs. So first, all the dogs kind of act like their owners. Mean dog, mean owner. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, what a good plan. Uh, Yeah, but also the dogs, you know, could kind of foreshadow what's going to happen in the story. Fanny gets hanged, and you know what happens to Isabella. Catherine and Harriton's dog fights, and they fight, and... So little Heathcliff, just like his little father, is described as a little whelping dog. (laughs) All right. So um, what does it mean? I mean, what are we supposed to draw? Are we supposed to draw any deep life lessons from the whole dog thing? I don't know. It's just interesting, really. It's an English teacher nerd thing, I think, to see. Is it an artistic moment? Yeah, I think so. You see these motifs, things that repeat over and over again, and it's just worth noting. And here, uh, they do kind of help you understand each character because each character kind of has a bit of a corresponding dog that gives us clues about who they are and by watching what happens to the dog to kind of see some foreshadowing about what's going to happen in the story. 
So it's just kind of an added little element to pay attention to. Well, I'm really glad you pointed that out because I think that would get by most people. So yeah, it's, nice it's just kind that. of funsies. I mean, you can't. It doesn't. You know, it's not going to fundamentally alter your understanding of what's going on, but it's no. just clever. But yeah, I'm gonna say it's part of the art. The art of the writer. Yeah, of things I think like so. That. So, all right. So you know, uh, time's going to go on about two years apparently, and and after Linton shows up. Um, Heathcliff runs into Kathy, who is now 16. This will be Kathy number two. Linton is 15, and Heathcliff asks her uh, or talks her into coming to uh, Wuthering Heights. And Nellie is with her. And again, we see the master manipulator at work. And he says, I want her to see Linton. He's looking better these few days. It's not often he's fit to be seen. That's so horrible. And we'll soon persuade her to keep this visit secret. Then he, then he goes on to say, uh, my design is as honest as possible. I'll inform you of its whole scope, that the two cousins may fall in love and get married. I'm acting generously to your master. His young chit has no expectations, and should she second my wishes, she'll be provided for at once as joint successor with Linton. And there's a plot. Oh, I know. So he's been he's had Linton for a couple of years, and now Linton is bait, basically to lure Catherine closer and closer to the heights. Of course, we know ultimately it's because he wants to abduct an incarcerator. But notice Bronte uses this moment to take another stab at Britain's. Sorry, Britain, but you had these ridiculous property rights that were terrible violations towards women. I know America wasn't much better, but uh the idea that it could be considered generous for Kathy too to marry Linton, uh, who's the natural heir to Kathy's property that she's lived on her whole life. I mean, it's obviously outrageous, but the realities uh, for women during this time period. Well, and of course, um, here in this first exchange between Kathy and Linton in chapter 21, uh, we see that Linton is going to require that Kathy take all the responsibility in their relationship. Um, um, they want to see each other again, but Linton says this when Kathy wants him to come to her house. Well, it's worth reading. Kathy wants him to come to her house because she's been to his house. Uh, and But he says this, It will be too far for me to walk. Four miles would kill me. No, come here, Miss Catherine, now and then. Not every morning, but once or twice Thomas. a week. <laughs> Walk four miles, no big deal. I mean, it's, for her, it's not no big deal for him for her to walk four indeed, miles each yes. way. Indeed, <laughs> yes. Uh, and it starts off small, uh, but this asking her to give more and more goes on until uh, when Nelly is sick, she actually makes the four mile walk back and forth every day. Well, she just does it, and it's actually angering to read this because while she's there, he's mean to her too. I mean, sometimes they have fun together and. Once in a while, they were drinking warm wine and eating gingerbread. And, you know, once they discovered some old toys with H and C on them, which, of course, he thinks means Heathcliff, but it meant Henley. <laughs> but anyway, mm. that used to belong to, you know, I guess her her parents. But the relationship overall is not enjoyable for Kathy, and everyone can understand this. She becomes a different person also because of this relationship, becomes mm -hmm. somebody that she's not. She becomes deceptive, and she's dishonest. She's never been like that before. This is not her real authentic self. He's made her this. Which, by the way, is the perfect manifestation of that exact type of relationship. And um, uh, again, this is a characteristic we see today in a lot of unhealthy relationships. I mean, when one party uh, has to become something they're not and they're not comfortable being, and if they have to make uh, moral compromises that they wouldn't really make under any other circumstances, you're seeing the dysfunction at work. And here she's being asked to betray her father, and she does that for a little bit. Well, in their case, the betrayal starts with this incredibly complex letter-writing scheme, and it goes back and forth for quite some time until Nellie finds out and burns the letters. But Linton always wants her to love him better than her father. In fact, when it comes to Linton, their parents are never out of the picture. I told you that. They're these kind of mini-me's, even in their own minds. There's this odd exchange that stands out to me. Linton denied that people ever hated their wives, but Kathy affirmed that they did. <laughs> 
and uh, this is just kind of a, a, an interesting place to read. Should we do it? And then you would like me as well as your father, observed he more cheerfully. But Papa says you would love me better than him and all the world if you were my wife. So I'd rather you were that. No, I should never love anybody better than Papa. And people hate their wives sometimes, but not their sisters and brothers. And if you were the latter, you would live with us. And Papa would be as fond as you if he is of me. Linton denied that people ever hated their wives, but Kathy affirmed they did. And in her wisdom, instance his own father's aversion to her aunt. I endeavored to stop her thoughtless tongue. I couldn't succeed until everything she knew was out. Master Heathcliff, much irritated, asserted her relation was false. Papa told me, and Papa does not tell falsehoods. My Papa scorns yours. He calls him a sneaking fool. Yours is a wicked man, and you are very naughty to dare to repeat what he says. He must be wicked to have made Aunt Isabella leave him as she did. She didn't leave him. You shan't contradict me. She did. Well, I'll tell you something. Your mother hated your father. Now then. Oh, And she loved mine. You little liar, I hate you now. She did, she did. Hush, Master Heathcliff, I said. This is Nellie talking. That's your father's tale too, I suppose. It isn't. You hold your tongue. She did, she did, Catherine. She did, she did. Catherine, beside herself, gave the chair a violent push and caused him to fall against one arm. He was immediately seized by a suffocating cough that soon ended his triumph. Of course, this makes me laugh because Linton actually complains that she's physically abusing him later, which stands out. And of course, this ultimately leads to this big love declaration in chapter 20. Naturally, everything in this relationship would have to lead to a love declaration only (laughs) in crazy world. It's a terrible love declaration. I agree. Read it for us. Sit down and take your hat off, Catherine, he answered. You are so much happier than I am. You ought to be better. Papa talks enough of my defects and shows enough scorn of me to make it natural that I should doubt myself. I doubt whether I am not altogether as worthless as he calls me frequently. And then I feel so cross and bitter. I hate everybody. I am worthless and bad in temper and bad in spirit almost always. And if you choose, you may say goodbye. You'll get rid of an annoyance. Only, Catherine, do me this justice. Believe that if I might be as sweet and as kind and as good as you are, I would be as willingly and more so than as happy and as healthy. And believe that your kindness has made me love you deeper than if I deserved your love. And though I couldn't and cannot help showing my nature to you, I regret it and repent it and shall regret and repent it till I die. I felt he spoke the truth, and I felt I must forgive him, and though we should quarrel the next moment, I must forgive him again. We were reconciled. We both cried, both of us, the whole time I stayed, not entirely for sorrow, yet I was sorry Linton had that distorted nature. He'll never let his friends be at ease, and he'll never be at ease himself. I've always gone to his little parlor since that night, because his father returned the day after. About three times, I think, we were married. And hopefully we were the first evening. The rest of my mid-visits were dreary and troubled. What so a relationship. Like, she's only been happy three times. <laughs> In his presence. Oh, my hmm. gosh. Uh, and the emotion she describes is a need to forgive him. But she also doesn't think that he can really survive without her. I mean, she talks of enduring him, not having resentment. I mean, it's exactly the kind of... Um, unhealthy codependency that uh, Heathcliff was so determined to create on purpose. And as far as Heathcliff is concerned, everything is going according to the plan. Uh, His plan is for Kathy to be trapped in this relationship with Linton and grow to resent and hate him. Uh, Emotions he has for her father. So much Freudian projection going on. Well, except there's more going on than just this. Because while all of this master manipulation is going on, there's another story that Bronte runs parallel to this one through these very chapters. And it's often easy to overlook, but it's there. And that's the story of the evolution of Harriton. Well, another point about human nature to make is that Catherine number two, is that? <laughs> as you call her, is not Catherine number one, obviously. And and although she has a lot um, of, of the spunk and the strong uh, will of her mother, and although she's been coddled by her father, Heathcliff 
has underestimated her. That's true. And this does get confusing. But back in chapter 18, because so this episode isn't chronological because we do have these two stories that are running parallel. But Edgar is away getting Linton. And Catherine finally leaves the house for the first time. She wanders off really just to explore the moors, but she ends up finding her way to Withering Heights. And while she's there, she meets Harriton for the first time. She's 13, but he's 18. And Nellie describes Harriton to the readers for the, to us for this first time. And she says this, he was a well-made athletic youth, good looking in features and stout and healthy, but attired in garments befitting his daily occupations of work on the farm and lounging among the moors after rabbits and game. Still, though, I could detect in his physiognomy a mind owning better qualities than his father ever possessed. Good things lost amid a wilderness of weeds. He doesn't know how to read or write. He doesn't have manners because Heathcliff has been raising him to be a feral beast. And at first, Kathy is going to be shocked and she's rude to him. She snubs him for a long time. Uh, which can be kind of funny because he cusses at her, something no one has ever had the audacity to do before in her little world, and garden I, world. I, I love the name calling. He calls her a saucy witch. Saucy witch. <laughs> uh, and there's more scandalous language than that. But Nellie tells her, and she's outraged to find out he's her cousin. True. And Heathcliff really counts on his being so crude and repugnant so as not to be attractive to Catherine. During the courtship between Linton and Kathy, what we see, if we look closely, is that Harriton is always around. Well, we also see that Heathcliff is constantly complaining to Nellie about how weak Linton is and how despite everything Heathcliff has done, Harriton has a lot going on. He says this, 20 times a day I covet Harriton with all his degradation. I'd have loved the lad had he been someone else, but I think he's safe from her love. I'll pit him against that paltry creature unless it bestirs itself briskly. We calculate it will scarcely last till it's 18. And when he's talking about it, he's talking about his son, Linton. He refers to him as an it. He goes on to say how he understands what Harriton is going through because Heathcliff has treated him poorly, but in spite of all of that, Harriton is a good person. And that is an admission that Heathcliff is forced to make. He says this, one is gold put to the use of paving stones. The other is tin polished to ape a service of silver. Mine has nothing valuable about it, yet I shall have the merit of making it go as far as such poor stuff can go. His had first-rate qualities, and they are lost, rendered worse than unavailing. I have nothing to regret. He would have more than any, and I'm aware of, and the best of it, Harriton is damnably fond of me. (laughs) So all that, he still likes Heathcliff. Well, I mean, he's crude, he's uncultured, he can't read. Uh, But what even Heathcliff seems to admit is that he has a depth of character. Uh, For one thing... He chooses to love Heathcliff no matter how he's treated. And another thing, he does seem to be really intelligent and and self-aware. And uh, one of the more surprising exchanges we see in the whole book is when Harrington, seeming out of nowhere, comes up to Kathy on one of her uh, many trips to the care of Linton and shows her he's been teaching himself how to read and write. Yes, let's read Kathy's account to Nellie about this exchange and how Nellie feels about it. Miss Catherine, I can read yawn, no? Wonderful, I exclaimed. Pray, let us hear you. You are grown clever. He spelt and drawled over by syllables the name Harriton Earnshaw. And the figures, I cried encouragingly, perceiving that he came to a dead halt. I cannot tell them yet, he answered. Oh, you dunce, I said, laughing heartily at his failure. The fool stared with a grin hovering above his lips, and a scowl gathered over his eyes as if uncertain whether he might not join in my mirth, whether it were not pleasantly familiar or what it was that he felt content. I settled his doubts by suddenly retrieving my gravity and desiring him to walk away, for I came to see Linton, not him. 
He reddened, and I saw that by the moonlight, dropped his head from the latch and skulked off, a picture of mortified vanity. I imagined himself to be as accomplished as Linton, I suppose, because he could spell his own name and was marvelously discomfited that I didn't think the same. Stop, Miss Catherine, dear, I interrupted. I shall not scold, but that I don't like your conduct there. If you had remembered that Hareton was your cousin as much as Master Heathcliff, and you would have felt how improper it was to behave in that way. At least it was praiseworthy ambition for him to desire to be as accomplished as Linton, and probably he did not learn merely to show off. You had made him ashamed of his ignorance before. I have no doubt, and he wished to remedy it and please you. So again, more uh, Bronte parallels. We see two boys courting a girl, except really she doesn't even know what's going on. Uh, Kathy in her childlike state is being manipulated um, in one sense, but in another sense, she's following her own moral code. And ultimately, this sense of morality is not going to portray her. Um, she's going to grow uh, out of her childish weakness and blindness into um, a more uh, passionate strength and generosity and empathy that more than her mother ever had. And uh, even in this state of um, being manipulated by Heathcliff and Linton, she is guided by empathy, which is so important. And it's something Heathcliff doesn't see, doesn't understand, and he will be defeated by it. Uh, one time when Nellie sees Kathy crying, she tells Nellie that she's not crying for herself, but for Linton. And she says this, he expected to see me again tomorrow and there he'll be so disappointed and he'll wait for me and I shan't come. And this makes her sad. Well, yes. And we also see this empathy in true love and the powerful declaration of love that she has for her father. Nellie says that her affection for Edgar, even after all the deceit with this relationship with Linton, was still the chief sentiment in her heart. Kathy's basic moral posture, even if at times she's a brat like we just saw and acts like a child, she is actually others regarding as opposed to her mom who is totally self-regarding. Listen to what she says about her dad. I love him better than myself, Ellen, and I know it by this. I pray every night that I may live after him because I would rather be miserable than he should be. That proves I love him better than myself. That is a very different speech than the I am Heathcliff speech that her mother made. <laughs> yes. And, uh, Kathy does have this innate um, willingness to sacrifice herself. And because uh, she has the capacity to put others first, she also has the capacity to meet Heathcliff in a place he's completely unprepared for. And that is what she does when Heathcliff locks her up and kidnaps her in chapter 27 and forces her to marry Linton. Not good. No. In chapter 27, Edgar is dying. Linton calls Kathy away from where she's been by her dad's bedside. He needs to meet her. And of course, the weather, as usual, is horrible. Kathy's about done with Linton. She fusses at him, and then Linton gives her this little speech. He says this, I cannot bear it, Catherine. I'm a traitor, too, and I dare not tell you... But leave me and I shall be killed, dear Catherine. My life is in your hands and you have said you loved me. And if you did, it wouldn't harm you. You'll not go then, kind, sweet, good Catherine. And perhaps you will consent and he'll let me die with you. Good grief. <laughs> he actually, at this point, gets on the ground and grovels, bowing down in total humiliation. He's begging Kathy to go to the Wuthering Heights with him. And of course... She's been told not to. So to do this would be a total betrayal of her father, something that Heathcliff is going to remind her later when he says, you cannot deny that you entered my house of your own accord in contempt of his injunctions. So she goes over there. Edgar is dying. He's forbidden her to step in this place, but she does anyway because Linton makes her feel bad. And then Heathcliff says some of the cruelest words I could ever imagine anybody saying to a daughter whose dad is dying read those gary these are just horrible Catherine, his happiest days were over when your days began he cursed you i dare say for coming into the world i did at least and it would just do if he cursed you as he went out of it i'd join him i don't love you how should i weep away as far as i can see it will be your chief diversion hereafter Unless Linton make amends for other losses and your provident parent appears to fancy he may. And this is the part that's so bizarre. Kathy agrees. She says this. 
I'll marry him within this hour if I, if I may go to Thrush Crash Grange afterwards. <laughs> that is hard to say. Heathcliff, you're a cruel man, but you're not a fiend, and you won't. Uh, this puts Heathcliff on the defensive, and he says, keep your F's fingers off and move or I'll kick you. Uh, and he traps both of them there for five days. They get married. Linton gloats to Kathy that all of her nice things, including her pony Minnie, is now his. Well, ultimately, Heathcliff's dominion has peaked, and he doesn't know it, but he's on the way down. Linton helps Kathy escape Withering Heights. She's going to run all the way home, and she gets to be with her father when he dies. One more parallel between her and her mother, who was also at her father's bedside, or really in a chair when he died. And listen to this. Edgar's final words, ironically, invoke Catherine one as well. He kisses Catherine two on the cheek and he says this. I am going to her and you, darling child, shall come to us. Wow, such intensity all the way to the end. Well, the critics always said you couldn't put it down. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And yet, although it's taking us five weeks to cover this incredible story, next week we will do exactly that. We will finally reach the conclusion of this extremely disturbing story. And on that note, I guess we'll head out for the night. Well, thanks for being with us. And uh, give us a follow on our Facebook page, our Instagram page. Check us out at howtolovelitpodcast.com. And again, thanks for being with us. Peace out. Peace out.